Good evening, everyone. My name is Lauren Myers. I'm a biology professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And tonight, I'm going to talk to you about tracking and curbing the next pandemic. Imagine that all of a sudden, Half the people you knew, your friends, your family, started dying from a deadly disease. This is exactly what happened in the 1300s when bubonic plague swept across Europe, killing 30 to 60 percent of the people that were living there then and forever changing human history. Imagine now that there is a deadly disease that is infecting three out of four kids, and a third of those kids die from the disease. That was smallpox. In the 20th century alone, 100 million people were killed by smallpox. Smallpox, though, is one of the success stories of public health. In 1796, an effective vaccine was developed, and thanks to a global vaccination campaign, it was completely eradicated from the face of the earth by 1979. Tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, these diseases, along with cholera and pneumonia, these are today's plagues. These diseases kill 10 to 20 million people every year, the vast majority of whom are kids living in the developing world. And each of these diseases poses its own set of challenges. They spread in different ways, we control them in different ways, and each one seems to evade our best efforts to control them in different ways. For example, tuberculosis and malaria are ancient diseases that have been infecting humans since the dawn of humankind. And although we now have drugs and other measures to control them, we are facing large epidemics of strains of both of these diseases that are resistant to almost all the drugs we have to fight them. HIV and AIDS, that's a relatively recent disease. We only identified it in humans in 1981. And since then, it's already killed 25 million people. And there are at least that many people living today with HIV. So infectious diseases are really devastating. But we're not powerless. Scientists, doctors, public health officials, and lots of humanitarians from different disciplines are working hard to try to get a better understanding of them and, and do better at controlling them. And we have had some successes, particularly in the developed world. If you think about the United States in the 20th century, we started the century with finally all 50 states having their own public health agencies. In the first couple decades, we had better sanitation, water became chlorinated. In the teens, in the 20s, our first vaccines became widely available for some important childhood diseases like pertussis and diphtheria. In the 1940s, we finally had the mass production of antibiotics. And when you compare the deaths due to infectious diseases to the deaths due to other causes, as you see in this graph here, what you see is we started the century with almost half of deaths being due to infectious diseases, and now today infectious diseases in the US constitute a very small fraction of the deaths. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about one disease in particular, influenza. It hits close to home every year during our flu season, and the specter of a deadly pandemic of flu sometime in the near future is something we need to take very seriously. I'm going to be talking to you about flu from the perspective of a mathematical biologist. In my field, we use mathematics, we use statistics, we use computer science in order to get a better understanding of how diseases spread and help to develop more, more effective control measures. I'm going to do this in three parts. First, flu 101. Second, I'm going to share some tricks of our trade. And finally, I'm going to give you some examples of how we use math to help in the fight against flu.